third. For resistance of superior powers, we have in this period first the practice of some noblemen at Ruthven in the year 1582, who took the king and seized on that errant traitor, enemy to the church and country, the Earl of Arran, declaring to the world the causes of it, the king's correspondence with papists, his usurping the supremacy over the church, and oppressing the ministers, all by means of his wicked counselors, whom therefore they removed from him. The king himself admitted a declaration allowing this deed. The general assembly approved of it, and persuaded to a concurrence with it, and nothing was wanting to ratify it, as a most lawful and laudable action. At length the fox escapes, and changes all and retracts his former declaration. The lords again rally and enterprise, the taking of the castle of Stirling, and gain it, and afterwards surrender it, after which the Earl of Gowrie was executed, and ministers are commanded to retract the approbation of the Ruthven business, but they refused, and many were forced to flee to England, and the lords were banished. But in the year 1585 they return with more success, and take the castle of Stirling. The cowardly king does again acknowledge and justify their enterprise, quote, that they needed no apology of words, weapons had spoken well enough and gotten them audience to clear their own cause, unquote. But his aftercarriage declared him as crafty and false as he was cowardly and fearful. Again, we have the advice of the General Assembly for resisting when the ministers were troubled upon Mr. Black's business and there was an intention to pull them out of their pulpits. They advised them to stand in the discharge of their calling if their flocks would save them from violence, and yet this violence was expected from the king and his emissaries. As to that point, then, there can be no dispute. Fourth, there was little occasion for the question about the king's authority in this period, but generally all acknowledged it, because they were not sensible of his usurpation, and his cowardice made him incapable of attempting anything that might raise commotions in civil things. Yet we remark that whatsoever authority he usurped beyond his sphere, that was disowned and declined by all the faithful as the supremacy. Next, that they resented and represented very harshly any aspiring to absoluteness, as Mr. Andrew Melvin could give it no better name, nor entertain no better notion of it than to term it the bloody gully, as he inveighs against it in the assembly, 1582. And next, in this same period, we have a very good description of that authority, which the king himself allows not to be owned, which out of a king's mouth abundantly justifies the disowning of the present tyrant. This same King James, in a speech to the Parliament in the year 1609, saith, quote, A king degenerateth into a tyrant, when he leaveth to rule by law, much more when he beginneth to invade his subjects, persons, rights, and liberties, to set up an arbitrary power, impose unlawful taxes, raise forces, make war upon his subjects, to pillage, plunder, waste, and spoil his kingdoms." Unquote. Period 5. Containing a testimony for the last reformation from prelacy in all its steps, from the year 1638 to 1660. The following period, from the year 1638 to 1660, continues and advances the testimony to the greatest height of purity and power that either this church or any other did ever arrive unto, with a gradation, succession, and complication of wonders of divine wisdom, power, justice, and mercy, signally and singularly owning and stealing it, to the confusion of his enemies, comfort of his people, conviction of indifferent neutrals, and consternation of all. Now after a long winter and night of deadness and darkness, the sun returns with an amiable approach of light and life. Now the winter was past, the rain was over and gone, the flowers appear on earth, and the time of singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Now the second time, the testimony comes to be managed in an active manner, as before it was passive. As the one hath been always observed to follow interchangeably upon the other, especially in Scotland, and the last always the greatest, which gives ground to hope, though it be now our turn to suffer that when the summer comes again after this winter, the day after this night, the next active testimony shall be more notable than any that went before. The matter of the testimony was the same as before, for the concerns of Christ's kingly prerogative, but with some more increase as to its opposites, for these grew successively in every period, the last always including all that went before. The first period had gentilism principally to deal with, the second popery, the third popery and tyranny, the fourth prelacy and supremacy. This fifth hath altogether 
and sectarianism also to contend against. The former had always the opposites on one hand, but this hath them in extremes on both hands, both fighting against one another, and both fighting together against the Church of Scotland, and she against both, till at length one of her opposites prevailed, that is, the sectarian party, and that prevailing brought in the other to wit the malignant, which now domineers over all together. Wherefore, because this period is in itself of so great importance, the revolutions therein emergent so eminent, the reformation therein prosecuted wanting little of its perfect com complement, excuse me, the deformation succeeding in its deviation from the pattern being so destructive, to the end it may be seen from whence we have fallen, and whether or not the present reproach sufferers have lost or left to their ground, we must give a short deduction of the rise, progress, and end of the contendings of that period. In the midst of the forementioned miseries and mischiefs that the pride of prelacy and tyrannical supremacy had multiplied beyond measure upon this church and nation, and at the height of all their haughtiness, when they were setting up their Dagon and erecting altars for him, imposing the service book and book of canons, etc., the Lord in mercy remembered his people, and surprised them with a sudden unexpected deliverance by a very despicable means, even the opposition of a few weak women at the beginning of that contest, which, ere it was quashed, made the tyrant tumble headless off his throne. The zeal against the English popish ceremonies obtruded on Edinburgh did first inflame some feminine hearts to witness their, de their detestation of them, but afterwards was followed out with more masculine fervor, accosting king and council with petitions, remonstrances, protestations, and testimonies against the innovations, and resolving upon a mutual conjunction to defend religion, lives, and liberties against all that would innovate or invade them. To fortify which, and conciliate the favor both of God and man in the resolution, all the lovers of God and friends to the liberty of the nation did solemnly renew the covenant, wherein they were signally countenanced of the Lord, which, though in itself obliging to the condemnation of prelatical hierarchy, and clearly enough confirming presbyterial government, yet they engaged into it with an enlargement to suspend the practice of novations already introduced. And the approbation of the corruptions of the present government, with the late places and power of churchmen, till they be tried in a free general assembly, which was obtained that same year, and indicted at Glasgow, and there, notwithstanding all the opposition that the king's commissioner could make, by protestations and proclamations to dissolve it, the six preceding assemblies establishing prelacy were annulled, the service book and high commission were all condemned, all the bishops were deposed, and their government declared to be adjured in that national covenant, though many had, through the commissioner's persuasions, subscribed it in another sense without that application, as also the five articles of Perth, were there discovered to have been inconsistent with that covenant and confession, and the civil places and power of churchmen were disproved and rejected. On the other hand, presbyterial government was justified and approved, and an act was passed for their keeping yearly general assemblies. This was a bold beginning, into which they were animated with more than human resolution against more than human opposition. Hell as well as the powers of the earth being set against them. But when the Lord gave the call, they considered not their own deadness, nor, their, nor were daunted with discouragements, nor staggered at the promise through unbelief, but gave glory to God, outbraving all difficulties, which in the following year were much increased by the prelates and their popish partakers, rendezvousing their forces under the king's personal standard, and, menace, and menacing nothing but misery to the zealous covenanters. Yet when they found them prepared to resist, or forced to yield to our pacification, concluding that an assembly and parliament should be held for healing all grievances of church and state, in which assembly at Edinburgh the covenant is ratified and subscribed by the Earl of Traquair, commissioner, and enjoined to be subscribed by the body of the whole land, with an explication expressly condemning the five articles of Perth, the government of bishops, the civil places and power of churchmen, but the sons of Belial cannot be taken with hands, nor bound with bonds of faith, humanity, or honor. For in the year following, king and prelates, with their popish abettors, go to arms again, but were fain to accommodate the matter by a new pacification, whereby all civil and religious liberties were ratified. And in the following year, 1641, by laws, oaths, promises, subscriptions of king and parliament, fully confirmed by the king, Charles I, being present and consenting to all, 
though in the meantime he was treacherously encouraging the Irish murderers, who by his authority made a massacre of many thousand innocent Protestants in Ireland. But in Scotland things went well. The kingdom of our Lord Jesus was greatly advanced, the gospel flourished, and the glory of the Lord did shine upon us with such a splendor that it awakened England, and animated the Lord's people there, then groaned under those grievances from which Scotland was delivered, to aspire to the like reformation. For advice in which, because though all agreed to cast off the yoke of prelacy, yet sundry forms of church government were projected to be set up in the room thereof, chiefly the independent order, determining all acts of church government as election, ordination, and disposition of officers, with admission, excommunication, and absolution of members, to be done and decided of, by the voices of every particular congregation without any authoritative concurrence or interposition of any other, condemning all imperative and decisive power of classes, etc., as a mere usurpation. Therefore the brethren in England wrote to the assembly when sitting at Edinburgh, who gave them answer, quote, that they were grieved, that any of the godly should be found not agreeing with other reformed churches, in point of government as well as doctrine, and that it was to be feared wherein the hedge of discipline and government is different, the doctrine and worship shall not long continue the same without change that the government of the church by compound by compound presbyteries and synods is a help and strength, not a hindrance to particular congregations and elderships in all the parts of government and are not an extrinsical power set over particular churches, but the intrinsical power wherewith Christ hath invested his officers who may not exercise independently but with subordinate but with subordination, excuse me, under presbyteries, etc., which, as they are representative of particular churches, co-join together in one under their government, so their determination when they proceed orderly, whether in cause is common to all, or brought before them by reverence in case of aberration, is to the several congregations authoritative and not consultatory only. And this subordination is not only warranted by the light of nature, but grounded upon the word of God, and conformed to the pattern of the primitive and apostolic church for the preservation of verity and unity against schism, heresy, and tyranny, which is the fruit of this government wheresoever it hath place." Unquote. So from henceforth the assembly did incessantly urge uniformity and reformation with their brethren in England, as the chiefest of their desires, prayers, and cares in the year 1643, prevailed so far that the English Parliament did first desire that the two nations might be strictly united for their mutual defense against the papist and prelatical faction, and their adherence in both kingdoms, and not to lay down arms till these implacable enemies should be brought in subjection, and instantly urged for help and assistance from Scotland, which, being sent, did return with an olive branch of peace and not without some beginnings of a reformation in England. And afterwards, a bloody war between the king and parliament, with great success on the king's side, whence the papists at the time got great advantage, witnessed the cessation of arms concluded in Ireland. Commissioners were sent from both houses to Scotland, earnestly inviting to a nearer union to the kingdoms, and desiring assistance from this nation to their brethren in their great distress. And this, by the good hand of God, produced the solemn league and covenant of the three kingdoms, first drawn up in Scotland and approved in the assembly at Edinburgh, and afterward embraced in England to the terror of the popish and prelatical party, and to the great comfort of such as were wishing and waiting for the reformation of religion and the recoveries of just liberties. The tenor whereof did import their sincere and constant endeavors in their several places and callings for preservation of the uniformity and reformation in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government, the extirpation of popery, prelacy, error, and profanity, and preservation of the rights and liberties of the people and of the magistrate's authority in defense of the true religion and liberty, the discovery and punishment of incendiaries and retaining of the peace and union of the kingdoms, the mutual assistance and defense of all under the bond of this covenant, and the performing all duties we owe to God in the amendment of our lives and walking exemplary one before another.